So there's several messages in this because I've been looking at documenting a language in Papua New Guinea where there are 836 languages last count I heard of. Um, and this is one of them. So I lived in this place for quite a while as well and then went back to do research. One of the concerns in documentation also would be revitalization as languages start to die. So some of the points I make relate to that. And also grammar, meaning and minimal languages. So it's rather a lot of things all around the areas of health and childbirth. But when documenting, I wanted to do some, after having written a grammar about the language, I wanted to document issues that were important for the people and for different parts of the community. And one of the things I did when I just got involved in various topics, invited to share in papers with some of you and um, publish things on language and culture. But I also began to see that in the education syllabus, there are certain topics. For example, in the elementary syllabus, there's culture and community, and they want to teach children about health and relationships and the environment and so forth. And so I thought it's a good idea if I focus some of this language and culture research on the topics that will then help me to provide vernacular education better. If I understand one of them was time that I um, found very useful to study. And um, so more recently was looking at plants and health. The plants partly because this is an area where I notice children still have some vocabulary. So we have some children who are losing, who are not gaining language skills in the local language. But I found that they would often know the names of the plants and um, went to a conference in Papua New Guinea about traditional environmental knowledge where we were looking at the fact that we want to make sure the children don't lose this opportunity. But the other thing relating to health was the issue of childbirth because of the number of women who I have known who have passed away after giving birth or at the time. So I was collecting texts on my last visit visit which was specific to these two areas and in looking at it today I'm going to um, show you a few texts with the Koromu in it and then look at some aspects of the grammar that for, helped to form the narrative and how I could use NSM to help with that. So minimal English, minimal Koromu so to speak. And also to encourage the idea that to produce grammars for the local people themselves, the grammar that I have just written is very technical and that's for linguists. So I've constantly been thinking, how could I use this for local people? So these stories will show some of that. Now, in order to look at plants, interestingly enough, I had some templates of prompts to use to talk about plants, to find out about what they look like, what their size is, whereabouts they are. And one of them was which I haven't written here, sorry, but people do some things with this. And what do people do with this tree or this leaf or this plant? So the, that's where the overlap into health came in because with many plants, the stories or narratives that went with the plant were things that you can do for health. So the first plant here is separane. So um, seren, I'll read some of it and not all of it, but. Serene pohorebe menisa ya nabasi. They want to put the seeds to boil and watch them call it and drink the water. So that's from the planting, the picture there. So this is my interrupting question. Manasapa, what sickness? And after this morning, I'm thinking, well, would I be better to gloss that with illness? No. It's certainly not disease, and um, but there is a word, okay? And I think also it needs an explication of what it means. And it usually has to do with feeling something bad in part of the body, but that does not include um, things like sores and injuries. So then we have Sapa Nupu Nupu, malaria, sipiane. So examples included many sicknesses, malaria, diarrhea. As you can see, the malaria is not a local word. And usually people would talk about the sipiane is the water of excrement, liquid diarrhea, as we'd say. Um, so usually people talk about illnesses by talking about things like I have head pain or head pain in my head or I have, I'm burning up, hege, hege nira, that's like I'm on fire. And 
so it's talking about particular symptoms. Then the rest of this, this text is about what to do with the leaves of this plant. So, Wene Helerbe, Kuraranante, Kuranante, oh, I'm saying the word wrong, Kuraranante, Otape, Si Tahi Tahi Kuruntabsi, Si Mesri Merante, and then on the other side we have Si Epo Petayao Ahi Tahune Meredahne. So basically, this narrative is saying, Boil the leaves. When they boil up, remove them. Then you want to cover it all with cloths so that when the sweat runs down, then the smoke or steam from the red stones goes up. So basically, um, you've boiled them and then you put cloths over the top of you and the water with the leaves in. And then your sweat runs down and there's red, the stones are red because you've had a fire going, okay? So the smoke comes up. So you've got your sweat and the steam coming up. Um, so that was a, a local traditional method of dealing with a fever or with um, diarrhea. The second one is about sesepane. This is sesepane in the picture here. The leaves are very big. When a snake bites us, we want to chew the bark of sesepane and swallow it. So to deal with death adder bites, this is a good treatment. It um, doesn't always work, but if you get it in time, it could save your life. <laughs> okay. Um, yaru mo yaru mo. This is yaru. Mo yaru mo wo sapa tu buete torobe si palihete be si punba embaka be amba telbe nupuru mo. Sorry, I forgot to fill in all the glosses there. So this yaru, when you get sick or ill. You soak this and you eventually you beat it and then you get it and eat it to summarize quickly. So this is another um, useful for when you're ill with a fever or that type of thing. Okay, so there's three different texts about what people do. So this is partly documenting the information um, and what people can do with different illnesses. And this all came out of the template, which was totally in semantic primes of prompts to use to talk about plants. And this was the result of the, the conversation, the narrative that came. So as you can see, as it's, it's not in primes because this is, this is what people said in their own language. But the prompts really helped to do it. And um, the main one in this case was what do people do with these things? I haven't got it written down here. People do some things with this tree. What do they do? And then I had um, another point in my um, list of prompts was what do people think about these things or people think something about this plant. Um, this particular one's brought out what people do more particularly that were relevant to treating health problems. One of the things with these texts is that I haven't put them in bold, but if you see at the ending of some of the lines, um, I will come back to that in a moment, but there are uh, there is quite a lengthy affixation on the verbs. For example, in the one called sesepane, naire hosakarante, has the verb ho, and then it's got one, two, three, four suffixes. So we'll come back to that in a minute. The other stories which I haven't detailed in quite the same detail are about childbirth and um, These are, the first three are explanations, but these are more of a narrative by a birth attendant or a woman who did help with many births as, um, through her life. And so she's recounting what happens during the birth. One, in the first line we've got what are motohubao tare nagabuate. So in that particular case, the word tare, which is pain, is used. Um, but the rest of it, where it's si wai pe, si wai pe, si wai pe, that's about the contractions pain. So it's a different word altogether and it's only used for that type of um, feeling. Or it's distinct from the other words used for pain, which there are many, as some of you may know, because I wrote about them before. <laughs> um, so the other thing with this particular text is I could go through all of it. Um, 
but maybe I'll just mention parts of it. Then feel the pain contractions, and that's repeated several times. They get them. Her mother then goes and lifts to the outside and lifts her stomach's insides, and then the baby comes down and arrives. So she was demonstrating at the time, like lifting like this, this action on the mother's stomach to try to help. The baby comes down and arrives, and we cut the umbilical cord and bury it and wash the baby. We wash the young woman, change her things. Um, no, we dress her up in things, and then we go and sit them in the house with the first baby. And that's usually, that means in the house without the husband. The ba husband can't see them for a, a month with the first baby. Sit them, then wash them with water, then the husband's family, and all run up and then cook meat, and we used to give it to the woman's family. Um, so that was particularly for the firstborn. The secondborn, there's also that seclusion in the house after the birth, but only for a week or lesser time. So then we have this one, U ahale ehiba. So that means the one after that in English, but literally it means after that one's leg. So when recounting the birth order of children, you say after that one's leg. So U ahale ehiba mo tali nagabuate, again using the word, general word for pain. And um, I'll just read the English part on the next page. For that pain, our honey, they want to get it and eat it. So honey is important at childbirth. Babies, babies, they hurt, and babies hurt. But this is also a different word from normally used for pain or hurt. It's pele, peli. Feel the contractions on and on. Her mother and all go, so there could be more than one woman helping. Put the arms around her, pull her up. My child is finished, and cut the cord and bury it inside the hole. Um, this is when the mother's talking about helping deliver her own child's baby. And wash them in water, sit in the house, and they washed, and then they sat outside, and then they went quickly to the garden. So once they were allowed to go out of the house, after about a week, they would quickly go back to work. Um, and life would carry on. Okay, one of the things that, because it's about health, but also about grammar, because you can see from this text about the childbirth, at the end of the lines in the page three, you can see tear, and you can see pear, and you can see pear, and you can see tear, and pear, and tear, right down for at least the first um, six lines end in either tear or pear, and then you see several more later on, tear, pear, at the end of most of the lines, almost. So I've almost divided these lines into clauses, however, some lines have more than one clause. So virtually at the end of every clause is either te or pe. And this is what happens in a narrative usually because pe indicates that the next verb has the same subject and is cons happens consecutively. The te indicates that the next verb has a different subject and either occurs in close succession or there's temporal overlap. So in this particular text, that's very common because it's an account of events one after another and there's a changing back and forth. So this is virtually all one sentence all the way, well there's a couple of sentences. There's one that ends with Tara and then there's another one that ends with Moto Hubao. But they're quite lengthy sentences and you can have them much longer than that. Um, whereas if you look back at the page two and say, take the middle one that's fairly short, the first line has two clauses in it. Sesepane mona. This is sesepane. Which has two semantic primes in it. Which are mo and na for this and be. And then the second sentence is sesepane leaves are big. Which has one semantic prime in it for big. So there's two short sentences. Um, in this case, they don't have verbs. Oh, the, the first one has the verb be. The second one is a statement which uses the concept, the notion of be, but it's, um, it's juxtaposition of the two noun phrases. Then we go to the second line, and at the end of the verb, there's nte, N-T-E, which has a really lovely long gloss that I've given it, which stands for different referent, irrealis, close succession. So this is what's used. The, I've written the free translation as when a snake bites us, we want to chew the bark of sesapane and swallow it. 
and then in the third line you can see pair again, which is, um, in this case, we chew the bark and we swallow it. So that's a simple example of the same referent following. Then at the very end it has desid for, for want. And abacy is the prime for want, or one of the variants of the prime for want. So one of the things that I've been interested in doing, I've been writing the grammar using all the technical terms of a linguist, but thinking about how can we write this grammar for the community so that the children growing up who don't know the language very well could actually read something about their language in a language they could understand, and so that the many neighbors who live nearby who speak other languages might get more interested in the language. So these stories about health actually give you some examples of the differences. And as the time is moving, I will move on to page four again. This whole challenge of how do we write a grammar in a, con in a way that the, own, the community who are the speakers of the language could actually use it and access it. So at the bottom of page four, I have a number of quotes from different people about the complexity of this. The first one dates back to a workshop I went to years ago. <laughs> with some linguists in Papua New Guinea where some of us and the Papua New Guineans who were there were saying, how can we get grammars that we can understand? And um, I don't think I'd better go through all of these because I want to show you my suggestions, but these are comments from linguists about the complexity of this. So if we look at page five, we can avoid English linguistic tech terminology, as those of us in this room know, by using some natural semantic meta-language in English and in Karomu. And I think it would be a good area for a minimal language as well, because parts of it we could use actually the primes, as in the examples here with the future tense. There's an example there, which is all in Karomu primes. If you look in the box, it might be the easiest way to see it. Um, so it says, Ebono ato na haruhera uri abumo. And that's literally, I say this now, someone will do something after. So this is a way that the future tense could be explained. Um, the next example is for the non future, which is important in Karomu. Surumapa ato naharua uri apumo. I say this now, someone did something before. So basically, both languages is written in natural semantic meta language primes. The major difference is, of course, the forms of the words, plus the fact that in English we say, I say this now first, but more natural in Karomu to say it last. And to take some of those that were in the text, that's the part that's on the next page. The switch reference system, which is quite, you know, it gen has generated a lot of linguist discussion about languages in Papua New Guinea and descriptions. When I first tried to describe it, I found it quite challenging. But actually, here is some um, statements of what pair means. So the title of the gloss I've given for it is same referent close, close succession. But this is a proposal of how I could explain what it means in English version of the primes, which I could then develop and use in Karomu. I say this now, someone did something, this same someone did something after this. And I have had to do this very quickly this week, so it can do with some more thought. Um, this one also can be used for the future. So I can say someone will do something, this same someone will do something after this. So I guess one of the logistical things would be to do, how would I show that this is, you know, two different possibilities for pair. Te is different referent close dependency in sort of ordinary English or linguist English or what I have spent a lot of time thinking how, what it covers. But I could say, I say this now, someone did something, another someone did something after this. But there is another scenario where I can use it. I say this now, someone did something, another someone did something at the same time. With ne, different referent, irrealis, close succession, I say this now, someone will do something, another someone will do something after this. And with nte, 
different referent irrealis temporal overlap. I say this now, someone will do something, another someone will do something at the same time. It needs a little bit more refining because it's slightly more complicated than that, but that's the way <laughs> it comes. That's the simplest way at the moment to say what these um, parts mean. So I wonder what other people think about the proposal that one could take the grammar that as a linguist you've worked on and then create something for the community using minimal English, minimal Koromu, for example, or minimal any language where you're trying to do this. Um, to some extent, it can be done with the primes, but to explain in more detail than other aspects of language would come into it. Um, I know they're not lovely explications of the health ideas in the community, but this is what just I, I wanted to put together with these narratives because clearly the one about childbirth is a narrative in the sense of one event after another, whereas the, the um, selection of texts on the plants are explanations of their use. And it's very good when you're studying a language for the first time that no one else has written down to try to get different types of texts so that you get different types of language and some good examples of these um, different referent forms turn up in the explanations where they don't turn up in the um, more straightforward recital of events in the, um, the childbirth texts. Okay, so that's... I skimmed over some of the points relating to it, but the purpose of doing this... There's two purposes. One is documenting things that are important to people so that they can use it and be motivated about it. And that was one reason for looking at plants and health and childbirth. And hoping to find out more about why women were dying in childbirth as well. I don't know that that answer has come to light yet. And also using the text to generate further materials for the community, both about plants, health, and about the grammar. Thank you. <laughs>